please join me in welcoming to Google New York, Nathan Merwold. So, Nathan, you wanted to start with a presentation about the book. Yeah, well, let, let me show some pictures, um, and then we can uh, talk. And Sounds good. And then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Great. Great. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about modernist cuisine at home. Um, <clears throat> in uh, 2011, we released this book, Modernist Cuisine. This is what we call the big book, um, which was an encyclopedic treatment of all aspects of cooking uh, and the science behind it. Uh, so a, the interesting question is, what do we do next? And one next thing after that that we could do, may still do, would be pastry, baking, and dessert, because the first book didn't cover that. Uh, but uh, as our next act, we decided, in fact, we would do modernist cuisine at home instead. And the idea was basically that modernist cuisine was uh, about sort of the no-holds-barred approach to cooking. Uh, there are recipes that require a centrifuge or a rotary evaporator or all kinds of things that most people, I have them at home, but most people don't have them at home. Uh, so we decided we would do a book that would take the same ideas as modernist cuisine, but apply them in a way that was a smaller, a little bit less daunting book. It's this little pamphlet-like 700 pages. <laughs> it's more than my child we were <laughs> um, deciding earlier. And... Uh, uh, and try to do stuff that would address things that people could do at home. So every recipe in here you can do at home. Uh, it doesn't require unusual equipment, and it doesn't require unusual ingredients. Uh, and we, we also tried to really focus on practical techniques and use lots of photography to make it really easy to see what's going on. Um, well, one set of these shows our step-by-steps. The other thing shows what we call a cutaway. This is where we have uh, show you the magic view inside uh, your equipment. Uh, the people at Viking gave us this Viking stove to cook with. Uh, we cooked with it for a while, and then we, we cut it in half. Um, it's sort of like the 4-H kid that gets a little calf and raises it up, and then, oops. <laughs> so, uh, but we cut it in half, so you can see how, what it looks like inside. Um, like the first book, we have a washable kitchen manual. Uh, it's on wash washable waterproof paper. Uh, that's you can take it in the kitchen, get it uh, dirty. It's a little bit smaller format, too, and it folds back on itself because it's uh, spiral bound. Uh, and we kind of consider this the next part of modernist cuisine. Um, you know, it, it, it's focusing on home cooking. And home cooking just means two things. One is what I said earlier, that it are, it's a set of stuff that um, you can do at home from an equipment perspective. But equally important is that it's a set of um, cooking uh, of recipes that are less formal. You know, in the first book, we've got recipes from Ferran Adria and Thomas Keller and Heston Blumenthal and all the best chefs in the world. You don't typically cook that food at home all the time. In the new book, we have a chapter on mac and cheese. We have a chapter on chicken wings and, and other skewered uh, snacks. We, so it's a little bit less formal style in addition to being a, a little more, uh, uh, <clears throat> a little bit more um, accessible from an equipment perspective. So here's uncompromising physical quality. I, I wish I could say that about myself, but by God, I can say about my book. Um, so we tried to, to, to make the physical aspect of the book kind of cool. Um, it's, it's big. It uses great paper. Um, we, um, we, we sort of was sort of nerdy, but I figured I meant Google, so <laughs> that should be OK. Um, when you uh, typically print, uh, a picture in a book uses half-tone uh, screen. And uh, this is what it looks like when you blow it up. It's 175 line. An art book would use a 200 line screen. But this whole idea of using a fixed screen is sort of an old analog world concept. It's still done. Uh, we use something called stochastic screening, uh, which uses algorithms, uh, an error diffusion algorithm. And the, the dots are now all created uh, digitally. Uh, and you see, it just looks a lot better. Um, <clears throat> here's another thing most people don't realize. The gamut is the range of colors that inks can represent. And uh, most inks have a hard time with really saturated colors. So here's a picture from the book where the gray shows the stuff you can't actually represent in the, um, uh, in, in the color gamut. Well, if you buy something called chromocentric inks, you can show it all. And so people will ask us, uh, you know, how did you get all of that color in those pictures? Is that because you digitally processed it? And we said, no, we actually sprung for the expensive ink. 
because it turns out you just can't represent some color, particularly highly saturated colors. You'll see it's the tomato, for example, and some of the greens in the apple or the greens in that um, uh, cauliflower. Uh, those are the things that don't come across because they're highly saturated. Um, now, of course, a good question is why the hell am I doing a book at all? Why is it physical? And <clears throat> Uh, the original answer for modernist cuisine is that at the time we started there were no tablet computers except for the first version of Kindle which was tiny and black and white so just there, there was no iPad it hadn't come out um, and so we had to choose a platform and we chose print um, but here's the other reason here's a picture from the book uh, uh, from the original book and here's what it looks like on Kindle and on an iPad and the, once you decide you're going to do layout for a big, big, high-resolution display that you're going to get this close to, it's hard to just change it. Of course, you could do it, but if you just literally took the PDFs from the, um, uh, from the book and just said, I'm going to move them onto a tablet, it's not very usable because you're always scrolling one way and scrolling another way. And uh, <clears throat> it, it also, to me, is kind of boring because if you just took the PDFs, you don't have any of the thing that's magical about an interactive platform. Um, so we're talking about, and one possible future project is to make a really interactive version. But then that actually starts getting to be real work, because you have to animate, and you want to have uh, lots of things live, and you have to have a little different user interface. So at some point, yeah, for now, actually, print is a great way to deliver large, high-resolution pictures to people, uh, and particularly if I target the people uh, in this room or in, in, in the tech industry, then tablets would be even more appropriate. But if I want to have influence with lots of traditional chefs around the world and give them an ability to step up, actually print is probably a better platform from that perspective at the moment. So here's some fun facts uh, about the new book. Two volumes, 9.9 .9 pounds uh, unpacked, 684 pages, 228 of which are waterproof. Um, 23 chapters, 20, 210,000 words, 405 recipes, 114 that have step-by-step -step photos, and we took about 86,000 pictures. Um, and there's of which 1,500 are in the book. So here's how we can sort of put it um, uh, in perspective. If you took Modern Cuisine at Home and you put it all in one line of text at the same type, type size, it would be 1.4 miles long. That would stretch from 14th Street up to 42nd Street. Okay, so several subway stops. Now, to, um, and of course, we're here. That's, <laughs> that, that's the you are here. Um, modernist cuisine, the, the big one, that actually would go from lower Manhattan all the way up to 116th Street. <laughs> so uh, here's another comparison. P people will say, well, why is this book so expensive? And we said, well, look, it's, the first book was $625, um, list price, street price, maybe $460. Um, you know, right, the the uh, new book is $140. Currently, the street price is $130. I'd be surprised if that didn't go down. I have no way to control street price. Of course, that's what retailers uh, sell it at. Um, but it's only $0.41 cents per recipe and $0.35 cents per recipe in the new book. It's $15.63 a pound for this, but only $14 a pound. How can, does that compare? Parmesan Reggiano is $19 a pound. We are cheaper than Parmesan cheese. So if you love cheese, you should love this book. It's cheaper. It's a good sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I, I've, been, I've been trying to come out of being a programmer and actually learn how to, how to sell. Um, you know, as I said before, we got lots of step-by-step -step photos. Um, I don't think we have a single page that doesn't have a color photo on it. Um, here is another thing. In modernist cuisine, we decided we would have everything with weights, but uh, our new motto is now with teaspoons. In fact, well... For the home cook. Because home cooks... <laughs> now, when people ask, what's the first gadget you sh they should buy for their kitchen? I would say a digital thermometer. And then the second one is a digital scale. And they're like $20. This is not like any kind of an expensive thing. But it, once you get into it, weighing ingredients is faster and more accurate than measuring them out. Uh, and you don't have to worry about leveling it. You don't have to worry about is your sugar clumping a different way or, or, or some other thing. So I highly recommend the weight approach. But, but now we have teaspoons, by God. Um, whenever we do a recipe, we like to have lots of variations on those recipes. 
so uh, you know, here was something or the, the uh, one spread shows pesto, and we started off making pesto. Then we went, well, what the hell? Let's make a whole bunch of pesto-like sauces. Um, we started off with a chapter on chicken wings. And then we said, well, let's make yakitori style chicken wings. Well, but then if you like yakitori, the skune, these chicken meatballs are really cool. And then pretty soon we had saute and tons of other skewers. So we love having variations. And we want to encourage people to mess around and do cool new things with, with cooking. You know, it's not about here's a recipe for one thing. Lots of books will do that. We try to say, here's a principle and here's an example. And now here's a couple other examples and then Experiment yourself and go take it other places. Um, <clears throat> we have some uh, tables. We had a lot of tables in the, the big book. We have fewer in the, the small book. But here, uh, you know, if you're cooking uh, meat, there isn't a right way to cook it. If you want it rare or medium rare or pink or medium, th there's different levels and different temperatures, uh, different times that you can use. So we try to provide all that information. Uh, we do have things on sous vide in the new book. And sous vide is something that most people don't have the equipment for, but increasingly they are. So we decided it was fair to put that in the new book. But we also have lots of alternatives that don't require the equipment. Uh, so we have a, a sous vide salmon recipe where you just cook it in the sink. Just run the hot water. Um, we have a, um, a sous vide steaks for camping or tailgate parties where you, you fill a big cooler full of hot water. Uh, put your steaks in Ziploc bags. Just put them in there. No, no electric device or anything no else. No burgers at your house, are they just like regular? <laughs> you, do you ever eat just like a normal sandwich? Never. Um, if I'm everything. making, usually there's, there's, it's not normal. Yeah. Um, but I, I certainly, I mean, uh, tonight I'm giving a talk at uh, the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and so we're going to Shake Shack first. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the only pragmatic way to get fed in a certain, and they, make, they do good stuff. Um, you know, we, the first book had lots of ingredients that are pretty difficult to find. In this new book, we use ingredients which are all easy to find, but they still might not be totally familiar. And again, we thought that was okay. So we have things that involve, involve agar. People say, well, isn't that some weird chemical? And I said, well, actually, it's been used in Asia for a thousand years. It's, it's actually more traditional than gelatin by that by that standard, it's been around for longer. But between that and a whole variety of these other things, whey protein powder from the um, health food store uh, or xanthan gum, which is in essentially every grocery store now because you can't make gluten-free muffins without xanthan. As a result, it's, it's always there. And we're just saying, hey, now you can use it for something besides gluten-free muffins. You can make uh, uh, thickened sauces with it. We have a lot of science in this new book, not as much as the previous book. Um, but we have a lot of things where we describe the science of things and then try to provide pointers off to people either in the web or other books or to the, the big book that um, will explain things more. Um, hell of a process making the book. Here's, here's a few of the photos. Here's one of our fun toys. Um, this is an ultra high speed camera. It shoots uh, HD quality um, 720p video at 6200 frames per second. So this lets us do things like this. Wow. Now, what I love about this is it, when I was a kid, I'd watch these um, Roadrunner cartoons, and the Roadrunner would run off the edge of the cliff, uh, and so would the coyote, but the coyote would only fall after he looked down. So nobody told the water it was time to fall yet, so it kind of sits there. Um, <clears throat> hey, here, I'll just run through a few of the um, uh, spreads from the book. We'll talk uh, a little bit about it, and then we can sure. turn to more of a conversation. Um, it, this is uh, our chapter on stocking the modernist uh, kitchen. That's about uh, different kinds of equipment, basically, uh, countertop tools. Um, it turns out if you take a picture of a blender while, um, while it's praying uh, uh, tomatoes, you make a hell of a mess. Um, but we had this great principle that it only has to look good for a thousandth of a second. After that, if it all goes to hell, that's our problem. That's not the... Uh, uh, the viewer's problem. You know, here's what a whipping siphon looks like from the inside, and we explain how you can use this for uh, making whipped cream or other kind of whipped foam things, but also for all kinds of other stuff. Again, this is not a piece of equipment everybody finds at home, but they're like 20 bucks, and they're in every Williams Sonoma, so we thought it was, was fair game. Here's our pressure cooker. Um, we really like pressure cookers. There's a lot of pressure cooker recipes in the book. Uh, here's our Viking stove cut in half. Um, Microwave oven. Uh, I was just on the Rachel Ray show right before coming here, 
where I actually did two microwave things. Um, watch closely, then we'll discuss it afterwards. So that's popcorn. Oh, amazing. Now, the cool thing about this from a science perspective is that when water uh, flashes into steam, it expands in volume by a factor of 1600. So right now, a tiny crack is formed. This is a steam rocket, basically. And it's coming up, and it's trying to relieve the pressure. And it's relieving the pressure a little bit by it leaking out. But that, that crack has also caused a fatal flaw in the skin of the, the popcorn. So you, you can watch it expand a little bit. It's trying to relieve the pressure, but ultimately, it's not enough. And whoosh, open it goes. That's why the high-speed camera is so much fun. Uh, and here's what a microwave looks like in the inside, including we discuss what happens inside the cavity uh, magnetron, which is where the microwaves are actually made. Um, in the, uh, the big book, we also have instructions for how you can measure the speed of light with Velveeta and your microwave oven. Do try that at home. Um, here's how we do those cutaways. We have a machine shop. <laughs> <laughs> machine shop is part of our lab, and so we're, uh, I, I highly recommend having a machine shop. Um, it, it's, <laughs> well, actually, originally I had a machine shop at home, but it, it's even nicer to have it in a place where people can run it 24 hours a day and clean up for you. <laughs> uh, as a programmer myself, I love that most of these machines are also really programmable, so you can actually control them all by writing programs. Um, here's one of our cool machines. This is called an EDM machine. See that wire? That wire has got a tremendous amount of electricity coming through it. Sparks jump off the electricity underwater. And those sparks actually are able to cut almost any form of metal. So here we're, we're cutting a uh, cast iron Dutch oven. We, we speeded this up a little bit. It's kind of slow. We drain the water off and voila, we have cut it in half. And between the other pieces of equipment, we can cut glass, we can cut almost anything in half like that. In fact, I like to say we have two halves of one of the best kitchens in the world. Um, you can see a couple of those that have the red uh, glue on it. Uh, that's a high temperature uh, silicone. So we take a piece of Pyrex, we put the high, a bead of the high temperature silicone on, and we can glue the piece of Pyrex glass to the edge of the pan so we can actually cook in it. Um, now that, that gives us that red goopy look. Um, and so that's where we use a little digital technology. When you cut a pan in half, you get two halves. <laughs> so we put the other half in the same position, take a picture, and that gives us the, uh, the image bits for the edge of the pan. And then we substitute that in for, uh, for where that red goop is. Uh, very much like the way in a Hollywood movie, uh, Spider-Man will fly through the air supported by wires. Then you digitally remove the wires and, hey, he's flying without it. Um, tons of other cool things uh, in the book. Here, here's two of them. Um, most of the flavor of char grilling comes from uh, f fat flare-ups. And one of the reasons when people grill zucchini, um, the zucchini doesn't taste all that charbroiled, is there's no fat in zucchini to drip. Okay, a steak, there's plenty of fat, it renders out, it drips, you get a fat flare-up, that's what gives you the charbroiled flavor. So what do you do if you want your zucchini to taste this way? You spritz olive oil on the fire. Works great. Um, and if you really want to sear something, you want the, the fire from hell, you take a hair dryer and you stick it up the uh, vent of your Weber. And boy, oh boy, you, you can actually get it going enough that if the coals are against the side of the Weber, they'll go through. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> so uh, for that photograph, the one that you were just yeah. showing us, is that that's where you put the glass on it and then you actually cooked to make that photograph? Um, like how did you actually... Let me go back and... So the answer is no, because the um, coals are so hot they would break the glass. There's nothing in front of that. <laughs> Some people say, well, but wouldn't the coals fall? We say, of course they would fall. That's why Johnny was underneath there with a pair of tongs. And every time they would fall, he'd put, put it back. <laughs> yeah. You, you, we made a hell of a mess, so you could get a cool picture. <laughs> um, uh, one of our guys lost his eyebrows twice in fl things flaring up. It, it, it's, it's a real process. <laughs> so, 
So anyway, here's, uh, here's fat flare-ups. This, uh, this is what happens here. The fat is dropping down. Initially, it spends most of the energy actually vaporizing and heating up, and then finally it catches. And it's that fat flare-up that makes uh, most of the characteristic um, char-grilled um, char uh, flavor. The difference between grilling and broiling is broiling, the heat's on the top, and so no fat can drip on it, and so you don't get those flavors. And that, that, that's really what the difference. Here's a close-up of that same picture here of the... Um, Here's our hamburgers, uh, and there's nothing holding those in. We've just sort of propped them right at the edge, and uh, say they, they kept falling. <laughs> uh, we have a big chapter on ingredients. Uh, ingredients, of course, really central to all of, of cooking. Uh, something on basics is about making uh, uh, sauces and stocks. Um, chapter on eggs, uh, salads, and cold soups. Turns out you need about two or three pounds of raspberries dropped one or two at a time before you get the timing right to get a photo like this. <laughs> you drop them and there's a bunch of ways you can set up uh, light beams to trigger, but there's variations enough that fundamentally it's several pounds of, of raspberries dropped. And Nathan, you took a lot of these photographs yourself, yep. correct? That's right. Yeah, I uh, originally was gonna take all of them, but uh, I got a lot of other things to do, so, but I took quite a few of them. Um, and then our, our photo team took the rest. Here's uh, salad making, um, pressure cooked vegetable soups. Uh, the, the, we had a recipe in Modernist Cuisine for carrot soup that was one of the most popular recipes. So we took it and made a whole chapter out of it, um, uh, tried lots of other ingredients, managed to make it work with some, uh, the first uh, version actually used a centrifuge, so we weaned ourselves off the centrifuge. And uh, here's a bunch of those soups. Um, steak, we have a whole chapter on steak. Carnitas, braised short ribs. So if that doesn't make you hungry, well then you're a vegan. But <laughs> <laughs> see pressure cooked vegetable soups earlier. Um, roast chicken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Goodness. roast chicken is an interesting thing. Um, the ideal roast chicken is fundamentally a contradiction. You're trying to get the uh, interior flesh to be juicy and the exterior to be crispy. But they're right beside each other. So by the time you've heated up the skin enough to be crispy, you've overcooked and dried out the flesh. So one thing people do is they brine it. And if you dunk the whole chicken in salt water, uh, the action of the salt on the proteins, the uncooked proteins of the meat, actually makes them absorb a lot more water. And so there's a, a, a real physical chemical reason that salt will make the uh, juicier. The trouble is there's protein in the skin also. And when you make the skin juicy, that's called rubbery. So what do you do? And the answer is we use syringes to inject the brine into the meat without getting any on the skin. Now you can say that's a kind of a freaky thing to do, but it turns out you can get syringes all over the place. It's not, you know... <laughs> when I first started coming yeah, to New York, yes. it was Union Square Park you'd go to get syringes. Um, but uh, <clears throat> in fact, there was another park in the city that was informally called Needle Park. Um, but you can get syringes all over the place, and if you really care about making the ultimate chicken, this is, this is how you do it. Uh, then the other thing is we hang the chicken inside the refrigerator, like this. That prevents the salt from accumulating on the skin. And if you leave it uncovered in the fridge with a, a plate underneath it, it lets the skin dry out. And that makes it much easier to make it crispy. Um, and this is the result. Uh, when we, you do it right, uh, when you take the, the chicken out at the end and you like hit it with a tongs or a, a spoon, um, the skin will crack. It's almost like glass. And then here, here we're serving it. Um, but we have another whole chapter on chicken wings. And I understand one of the... Google cafeterias today, they served a couple of our wings. I don't think they used hypodermic needles. But <laughs> yes. Turns out for the wings, you don't need to. There's, we have another technique for the wings. Yeah. Uh, chicken noodle soup, sort of the Jewish penicillin. We thought we'd do a whole uh, a chapter on that. Here's our uh, salmon chapter. Pizza, uh, mac and cheese. Um, that's the mac and cheese sauce being made. And boy, the, the interesting thing here is normally you put a lot of starch into a cheese sauce to keep the uh, fat in the cheese from separating. 
uh, cheese is an emulsion, and when you heat it up too hot to, to melt it, it separates out. That's, you've probably seen pizzas where you get this layer of grease on the top, and then the cheese is kind of stringy and disgusting. Well, in a sauce, that really doesn't work. So the typical thing is you put lots of starch in. Well, that adds a lot of carbohydrates, it, but the main thing is it dulls the taste. Because the starch molecules wind up coating everything, and so it doesn't taste anywhere near as cheesy as the cheese does. It's cheese-ish sauce, not cheese sauce. <laughs> Turns out if you add a little bit of sodium citrate, um, which is in every grocery store in New York, because it's also called sour salt, it's used in uh, Passover, um, it's also a so solid form of citric acid, just a little bit of that keeps the emulsion and so you can make a cheese sauce that has no starch in it at all and it tastes amazingly cheesy. Um, and then you can make, uh, you can use that to, if you cast it into sheets, you can use that to make your own melty cheese to make melted cheese sandwiches. Um, we find melted cheese sandwiches work so much better when there's no gravity. Um, <laughs> recipes we developed for the International Space Station. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's some of the pictures and I thought we could uh, have a chat. Yeah, thank you. Talk about it. That's extraordinary. Uh, you know, you call this modernist cuisine at home, but I feel like your home kitchen is very different from from my home kitchen. I, I, I think we've gathered that because I don't have things cut in half and, and the like. <laughs> so, what do you think I could make in my New York kitchen from your book without hypodermic needles and a blowtorch? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of New York kitchens that have hypodermic needles. Um, and and Not I, in love, this audience, I, 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 I love blow torches. Um, blow torches are one of the coolest uh, single tools. They're $20 at Home Depot. And when you need intense heat to touch up, like when you sear a steak, it's nice if you sear the edges of the steak. It just looks a whole lot nicer. And you can do that by kind of holding it up with tongs and trying to jam it into the bottom of the pan. That, that works, but it's even easier to put it on a, on a pan and you just take the blowtorch and you go around the edge of the steak. And so, so, so don't dismiss blowtorches. But um, essentially all of the books, all the, the, the uh, recipes in the book you could do in your, your New York kitchen. Um, some of them will be easier for you if you get some sous vide equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them will turn out a little bit better if you get a uh, pressure cooker. Uh, but a pre sous vide is the most exotic we get. But we thought it would be kind of a betrayal of our roots if we didn't include sous vide in a home book, especially now that you know, every Williams-Sonoma and, and you know, Sur La Table and comparable stores has them. Mm -hmm. So that, it, it sort of qualifies. But for people that don't have them yet, we say how you can approximate it at home. Right, what you said, running things under hot water. Instant. Yeah, so the, the main thing about sous vide is that uh, you, you want an accurate thermostat. And a lot of uh, traditional cooking, you are the human thermostat. It, either by using a thermometer or just by using your intuition, you're supposed to sit there and modulate the heat. Well, digital technology makes much better thermostats than we will ever, ever be. And, and there's some people who say, well, if I use that, aren't I, I'm, you're taking the soul out of cooking. I say bullshit. There's no reason. I do not feel soulful playing the human thermostat. Sorry. That, that, that's something that technology can just do better than me. So it, we describe in the book how you can u do sous vide either by keeping a pot of water hot on the stove and playing human thermostat or if you have a large volume of water, um, you can just, in, in the case of the salmon recipe, you run the water in the sink up to about 120, 130 degrees. You check that. It, uh, the tap water will do in almost all cases. Then you seal the salmon in plastic bags and you just put it in there. And as long as you've got a reasonable size sink and not too much in the way of salmon, there's enough heat capacity in the water that you don't need to actually keep actively heating it to keep that temperature. The temperature will drop a bit, but that's okay. Well, so you talk, I mean, obviously technology is your background and that's mm -hmm. sort of where yep. you come from. And technology clearly plays a huge role in all of your work on the Modernist series. So can you talk a little bit about that and how your background in technology sort of influenced the evolution of the series to the point it's at now? Well, I, I just gave you one of the examples of I don't think it's really bad to use digital technology to control the, the thermostat accurately so I can have this exactly the temperature that I want or to use scales or uh, other sorts of things. Um, in the case of the first book, Modernist Cuisine, uh, I actually wrote a lot of code uh, in the process of making the book because we did things to predict uh, the heat distribution uh, of um, 
uh, in a piece of food or heat distribution in a pan? Like, does it matter that you have the fancy copper pan? Mm -hmm. The answer is it really doesn't matter. Uh, copper is a much better heat conductor, so the idea is, well, you're going to get all this lateral heat movement. The thing is, the pan's this big around. The thickness is this much. So yeah, it's a good conductor, but laterally, it would have to go a hundred times as far as it goes up, so it doesn't spread that much. Unless you had a copper pan with like an inch thick block, oh, that would work great, but then it'd be too heavy to lift and too expensive to buy. And in fact, the real issue we discovered in doing this um, uh, modeling is you want to make sure your pan and your burner are well matched. You put a big pan on a little burner, and no amount of fanciness in the pan is going to help you. If, if you size them appropriately and your pan is not tissue paper thick, it just you'll be fine. Well, so I guess the but, answer is but, it played a big role. So no, yeah, technology, <laughs> well, it's the way I see the world right. is through the lens of technology and science. Um, I had a, a, a reporter in the UK uh, sort of was giving me a hard time for the first book. And I said, well, what, what makes you think you should bring science into the kitchen? I said, I'm sorry, science was always in the kitchen. I'm just trying to take ignorance out. <laughs> because the, the laws of nature are how things work. Okay, and you, you wouldn't say, oh gee, I, I, it's such a shame that this architect understood, or that built this building understood how buildings stand up. Gosh, isn't that terrible? No, it's a great thing. That means we're not going to come plummeting uh, uh, down. And it's for the same reason, giving people insights as to how the science uh, actually works is both cool if you're curious, um, and it's useful. And so I always like to say our books are for people who are both passionate and curious about cooking. If you're not passionate about it, you're not going to buy a big fancy book like this. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a cook. If you're curious enough, that'll do. If you're not curious, there's all kinds of cookbooks you can buy. They'll say, here's 30-minute you know, meals or cooking for dummies or something else. And you follow those recipes exactly, and you'll get what you get. It's if you have a curiosity to say, well, why does it work that way? And, and how do chefs at top restaurants do it? And why is this done? That's where we really have a proposition for you. Um, and so the whole thing was written from a technologist's or a scientist's or an engineer's point of view rather than from a traditionalist point of view. And so what was the initial inspiration for writing this series? And as you mentioned, you, um, you obviously come from a technology background, and so where did the interest in food come in and sort of so come I, together? I've been interested in food since I was little. Um, when I was nine years old, I uh, decided to cook Thanksgiving dinner. I uh, told my mom she couldn't come in the kitchen. I cooked it all by myself. I would do a lot better job today, but... <laughs> um, and then for many, many years, I was a, a self-taught chef. Uh, when I was working at Microsoft, actually, I decided I would stop being self-taught, and I decided I wanted to uh, go to chef school in France. So I convinced Bill to give me a leave of absence, and I went to work... Uh, I w well, to, to get into the chef school, I had to have professional experience. So one night a week for two years, I worked in a French restaurant in Seattle. Um, and then after that, the, the chef school would take me, so I went and I went to this intensive program there. Um, and so I, I've been into it for a long time. But then after leaving Microsoft, I started cooking a lot more. That was kind of part of the, part of the reason uh, I left. Uh, and I realized that there wasn't a big book that explained cooking from the point of view I had. Now, there's two ways to make a... Uh, a product, right? Uh, it, one is to say, I'm going to do market research and find out what they want. And they is some funny set of folks that we interview them and run focus groups and surveys. And, and uh, it's a fine way of making products for some things. But that's not how we d did the books. We did the books the completely other way, which is to say, we were going to make the book we wanted. Okay? It's our damn thing. And then we just pray that there's other people that agree with us. And the difference is that um, all of the best things in the world, in my view, are made this second way, by making what you want. Now, unfortunately, some of the worst things are made that way, too, or some of the great disasters, because it turns out you make what you want and nobody else does want it. But I decided we'd take the risk. And so uh, it was through that, and then uh, uh, the Internet played a huge role in it. There's um, a um, forum site called eGullet, and I started posting on eGullet about sous vide and other aspects of modern cuisine. And it was people on eGullet that uh, gave me the suggestion I write the book. 
But it was more than that. It was the, the community of people in Igalit spanned home cooks to some of the best, top professional chefs in the world. And everyone was eager to get this kind of information. And so I thought, well, that convinced me that it wasn't only going to be me that I was making this for. Right. So uh, what was your favorite discovery in the process of writing the book? I mean, because there's obviously some really cool things that came out of it, but what was the best um, thing that you found? Well, my favorite single one is, is, takes, is a little hard to explain, but when in traditional barbecue cooking, this is in the southeastern U.S. when you make barbecue, there's something called the stall, S-T-A-L-L. And if you're cooking a brisket or a pork shoulder or some other big honking piece of meat, then people noticed that the temperature would rise and rise and rise and rise, and then it would hit this point where it would stop rising and it would stall for hours, and then it would eventually come up again. Well, there are thousands and thousands. So, you know, do a Google search on barbecue stall, and you will see thousands. You can have a few things for somebody's barbecue stall, like in a farmer's market, but you filter those out. And there's still thousands of things with people saying, what the hell is the barbecue stall? What causes this? And they have lots of theories. And we discovered they were all wrong, and we found out what really causes the barbecue stall. Tell us. <laughs> what is okay, so it's, it works for the same reason we sweat. Okay, people sweat because when you water evaporates, it takes a lot of heat with it. And sweating is our body's way of using evaporative cooling. We'll spend some water to get a lot of cooling. Well, uh, meat is about 75% water. So you put it in a hot barbecue in hot air, it's going to start evaporating, and that cools, cools things down. And what happens is that stall period is the period when no matter how much heat you put in, the more heat is leaving because of evaporation. Now the funny thing is, what the, one of the traditional remedies for this is to slather more sauce on, which is exactly like trying to heat the thing up by putting a, a hose on it, right? It's, you will never get it hot if you keep slathering it on, but, but people do for a while, and there's various uh, uh, things about it. And so to, to test this, we, um, we took some briskets and cut them in half, and then we would either wrap one in foil or seal it in a sous vide bag, all instrumented with lots of uh, temperature probes, and right beside it, one that was open. Uh, and the one that was sealed had no stall at all, and the one that was, uh, uh, the, the one that was open had exactly the stall that you would predict. So interesting. Um, so what is your favorite cookbook? <laughs> <laughs> Apart from your own. Yeah, it's, um, it's a really good question. Um, you know, historically, the, the one that was hugely inspirational to me, but also very difficult, like, because I first got it when I was nine, was Escoffier. You're a very precocious child, weren't you? Uh, uh, I was reading a, Ramona pain in the, the ass for mom. Yeah, I was reading Ramona the Pest when I was nine, but um, the difference between me and you, I think. Is. But, so um, Escoffier was an inspiration to me, both positively and negatively. The, the positive aspect is that Escoffier um, was incredibly influential to basically chefs all over the world. It, the book came out in 1903, and it really sealed the deal for French food being synonymous with high-end food for the next century or so. I mean, it just, it just, it was incredibly influential. The negative inspiration is that it also had a variety of things that I definitely didn't want to do. So a typical Escoffier recipe will say, um, you know, prepare this, put it in a hot oven and cook until done. Now in Escoffier's time, uh, he was writing for people that were apprentices, that would have apprenticed to a master chef. And they didn't have any technology, even though they had thermometers, it wasn't common in a turn of the previous century kitchen. So hot oven, oh, what the hell was that? What's cook until done? What the hell is that? Um, we really wanted to make sure that we had stuff that had this more technological perspective of saying, no, we're going to tell you how to do it so you can get a good result even if you've never done it before. And we're going to do that by telling you, cook it to this temperature. Um, you know, cook it in an oven of that temperature. And here's how you tell if it's done and here's how you tell if it isn't done. And, and try to make the things as objective as, as possible. So sort of an inspiration for me in, in a couple different ways, positively and negatively. Interesting. Um, 
Well, I'm going to do a couple of finish the sentences with you. Okay. Finish the sentence, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So I'll ask whoever has a question. There's two mics in the room, yeah. and if you can use one of the mics, because we are recording this for YouTube, that would be great. So you can start lining up, and we'll get going. Um, modernist cooking is? Great. <laughs> um, modernist cooking is uh, cooking to make stuff taste great without regard to uh, feeling you have to slavishly follow tradition. I am challenged by? <laughs> Keeping clean. <laughs> I make a hell of a mess when I cook. <laughs> well, because you're cutting everything in half, I think. That's yeah, well, part yeah. of the problem. It's cooking with, in whole, we, we found out why most people don't cook with a wok cut in half. Right. <laughs> I, I probably could have told you that. But, you know, <laughs> um, a food trend I hate is? So, um, a food trend I hate, which has got multiple different forms, is when a buzzword uh, gets perverted to a use it didn't originally have. And so my, a good example of that, or bad example, depending on your perspective, is organic. You know, organic, once upon a time, meant uh, it was this stuff cooked, by, you know, grown by this hippie couple sort of at the edge of town, and they, they you, it kind of was ugly, but it tasted really good because it was picked in all these ways. Today, because people will pay a premium for organic, organic has been largely eviscerated by um, uh, folks that uh, have read all of the rules, lobbied the government to change the rules, and the food they have is effectively the same. Um, it, local is another one of these things. It's nice that something's local, but I promise you, if, if local starts getting a, uh, a market edge, people will find ways to cheat on it. Um, uh, one of the examples we have in modernist cuisine is uh, honey is essentially fructose. It's 90-some you know, percent fructose. But high fructose corn syrup, a lot of folks think that is bad. Uh, and there's some reasons to, to believe that it is. But the hypocrisy of the following thing just drove us crazy. Uh, we found there's a bunch of commercial honey places that basically fed bees with artificial uh, flowers <laughs> with high fructose corn syrup. So it was, it, it was fructose laundering, okay? <laughs> you feed it to the bees, the bees spit it. Oh, the bees loved it because they didn't have to do much work, okay? They suck up the fructose here, squirt it into the honeycomb, <laughs> and just, oh, hugely productive so that they could sell people natural honey. Um, here's another one. Um, uh, the, the way that, uh, the reason that you've got a red color and uh, some of the flavors and a cured meat like bacon is because of nitrites. And there is some legitimate concern about uh, whether nitrites are all that good for you and so forth. But if you go to Whole Foods, you'll find nice rosy red um, bacon that's nitrite free. How did they do that? They take concentrated celery juice, which has got the same nitrate concentrate as the original brine, but it happens that there's a lot of nitrates in the celery. Now, is that nitrate free? No, but in a ruling with the Federal Trade Commission, in fact, because it started off as celery juice, the fact it has the identical quantity, and if it didn't have the same quantity, it would not turn the meat red. <laughs> and that's why if, if you really cared about nitrate-free bacon, it better be gray. <laughs> okay? Because otherwise, it's nitrite by another name. So anyway, I, I hate that using hypocrisy to try to fool people uh, in, in some way. Okay, so that was a very long finish the sentence. Sorry. So we're only going to do one more so that we make sure. Um, I'm trying to think. Which, three things that are always in my fridge are? Um, fish sauce, uh, sesame oil. Uh, and uh, some rendered duck fat. I was expecting a much more bizarre answer, so that's all right. You surprised me. <laughs> okay, can we start over there? Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. The um, huh? book is uh, uh, fantastic, and I'm very much so looking forward to using it. My question is actually in regard to something you made reference to uh, right when you first uh, stepped up, and that's uh, in regard to baking. Yep. Um, so I don't know whether you've explored this as a potential next step, but I'm curious as to your thoughts around 
baking to me seems to be much more exact, much more scientific. Yeah. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how uh, maybe you see that as potentially an easier uh, world to explore as, as opposed mm -hmm. to traditional cooking. So uh, they're, they're, you're absolutely right that from a cultural perspective, uh, baking and pastry is more precise. Okay? Nobody adds baking powder to taste. Okay? First of all, it tastes terrible. Second of all, you can't judge by taste what's the right amount to make your muffins rise. And you better measure it pretty precisely, otherwise your muffins are going to overrise or they're going to be like hockey pucks. So pastry chefs uh, bought off on a lot of these things earlier on. Uh, one funny example is in, uh, in the book we use percentages in addition to grams, because if you want to scale it up, it's handy to do that. Now, the system we use is called baker's percentages. Why? Because every baking book has it, but no non-baking books have it. And it was funny the number of even professional chefs would say, well, what's this percentage crap? And their pastry chef would say, uh, chef, I'll, I'll explain it to you. you know, we've used it for 100 years in pastry. <clears throat> so uh, that's one thing that's different. Another thing that's different is that uh, there are pastry books uh, that take you much closer to the state of the art than savory books did. So if you read a, a pastry book by like uh, Pierre Hermé, for example, Paco Toro Blanco, and they, they, I could list all kinds of them, they probably will, would have more, more recipes and more techniques that were close to the state of the art than if you tried to find the same kind of thing for cooking meat, for example, where its state of the art was you know, 50 years ago in terms of, of what you find in books. That said, uh, the, uh, the world of baking and pastry chefs are very receptive to all of these things. Oh, here, here's actually one other point. Uh, at a lot of restaurants in New York, the modern uh, techniques in the kitchen, all pioneered by the pastry chefs. Okay, so at uh, Jean-Georges, uh, Johnny Azuni, he was the first sous vide cooked in Jean-Georges, was by Johnny for pastry. Um, at Le Bernardin, it was Michael Lascanis. And both of them, and lots of other pastry chefs like them, dragged the rest of their kitchen into the at least 20th century, <laughs> and, and, and maybe into the 21st. So, but for the same reasons, they're also very receptive to it. And there's an awful lot of really interesting creative things. So you know, watch this space. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, so uh, I enjoy smoking meats at yeah. home. Um, and I find one of the great things about it is um, if you're patient and you can control the temperature, then a brisket or ribs or a pork shoulder will just tend to be delicious no matter yep. what you do. So what do you recommend to sort of take it up a level? Um, okay. So we're really big on barbecue. Um, and what I'm about to say tastes great, but this is total anathema to traditional barbecue, folks. So you're totally right that low and slow is the way to go. Only we like to go lower and slower. So for um, pork ribs, I'd cook them at 140 degrees for 48 hours, sous vide. So this is, this is not like, hi, honey, let's have ribs tonight. No, it's, hi, honey, we'll let's have, have three ribs days. on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, it, now, and then, then you smoke them for a couple of hours with, again, you don't want to exceed maybe 140 degree air temperature. Uh, you can, turns out you can smoke them either before or after you cook them sous vide. Um, and uh, for a pork shoulder, I would do the same thing. I might actually take the temperature up a little bit to, um, say, 145 degrees. Um, but for 48 hours, for uh, short ribs, we typically do 145 degrees for 72 hours. Um, so this is truly patience-oriented. But, oh my God, the results you get are just unbelievable. Um, there's a guy named Stephen Reichlin, who's uh, considered one of the world's foremost authorities on barbecue. He's literally sold millions of his barbecue books. Uh, he came out to our lab, and we made uh, these uh, short ribs uh, for him. Uh, and he wrote in his blog that they were the best ribs of any kind he'd ever had in his life, which was more than we could possibly hope for. So, uh, so tr try that. Tr try um, get, get sous vide. You got. But hey, if you already have a smoker, you're already at, at the bleeding edge of, of, of craziness. You can keep it outside, though. What? That's fine, but d d d you can do your sous vide cooking inside. And, uh, you can do it ahead of time. 
right? In fact, you can also freeze it or keep it in the fridge after you, you, you've cooked it sous vide that way. You take a couple days off work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I o think Only smoke it, we find only, you only smoke it for an hour or two. Depends on how heavy a smoke flavor you want. But um, smoking for a really long period of time doesn't do you that much good because the penetration depth that you get with smoking is it drops off exponentially and so smoking it for six hours isn't that useful yeah so this idea that we can replace a lot of the sort of technique and skill that it used to be was required to cook right with technology is really neat and i'm just wondering if if i as a home cook go and do that if i buy your book and buy my digital thermometer and so forth and so i don't have to know when my food is done by looking and smelling what I now have a lot of free time, so what skills should I develop? What's my highest <laughs> marginal return to time in terms of developing kitchen? I say you work at Google. You, yeah. need, you didn't know what to do with free time. What's free time? Um, but it, here's a different way. I, here's a, a sort of an answer, which is there's a tremendous amount of cooking that is aesthetic in its essence. And there isn't a technological solution for that. So what combinations of flavors do you put in? What combination of textures do you do? How do you, um, if, if the dinner party got so simple, well, add a couple courses. <laughs> um, th there's always an axis that you can move in where there's an unbounded amount of stuff and where technology isn't going to help you. So while you've automated some things so that you'll never overcook it, you'll never undercook it, it's all perfect, it's, it's done great, well then you use that time to experiment, do some more cool stuff, add a couple dishes, add a garnish. Thanks. Okay, this is our last question. Okay. Thanks again. Um, you mentioned that the thermometer would be the first thing that you purchase, or you would recommend yeah. as a purchase. I remember the first Thanksgiving where I was trying to, I took over the kitchen, wasn't at nine, probably 19, but uh, I put in the probe thermometer and convection oven was going, and a few hours later, it reached temperature, started beeping, and I'm like, all right, it's done. And mom's like, no way. <laughs> and we cut in, and sure enough, it was raw. And so I wonder, like, do you cover basically the fact that meat is not you know, equal all, all throughout, like the proper way of measuring uh, temperature? Because that's really important, not just having the, yeah, the tool. Yeah, so, so we do discuss that. Um, the, uh, the really cool thing I have in this ovens that I have at home, which are sort of commercial grade ovens, you probably have them somewhere in one of your cafeterias. They have the coolest thing. They have a temperature probe that's got five separate probes in it. And so it not only does it look at pick the coldest one, but also looks at the gradient. And so then you can tell how it's cool, heating up or cooling down. And by doing that, you can figure all the way. But yeah, in general, what you want to do is you want to pick the thickest part of something. Um, in the case of poultry, the traditional thing is to put it down near the hip joint. That's not really because that's the thickest part. The thickest part is still going to be in the breast for a turkey. Mm -hmm. But that's the part that probably uh, is the most, you're most concerned about undercooking. Um, so yeah, we definitely cover that in the book, and it's true. You need to cover the. Um, you need to make sure your temperature is uh, representative. Otherwise, you're going to fool yourself. Right. Thanks. Okay. Well, we have time for. It. Thank you so much for being here. Well, That's thank really you. Great. Thanks.